Hello friends, this is Growl. In this video, we're going to be covering everything you need to know for Theater of Pain on Mythic Difficulty. I'm going to break down the scary trash mobs, all of the boss encounters, and any other tough stuff along the way. The dungeon is located in the dead center of Muldraxxus, and it has its own Theater of Pain flight path. Each dungeon in Shadowlands has Covenant-specific effects. In this dungeon, if you're a member of the Necrolord Covenant, you can activate banners that give your party a stat and speed buff for 5 minutes. These are extremely helpful and take little to no time or routing to activate, so if possible, always have a Necrolord in your party for this one. The dungeon starts as you enter the theater. Aesthetically, this is one of the coolest entrances in Shadowlands. The first pack of mobs you run into is actually quite difficult and it's important you know how to deal with them. The Raging Bloodhorn has a tantrum, pulsing heavy physical damage every 2 seconds. Although it can't be interrupted, using a D and Rage effect like Trank Shot or Soothe will immediately stop the damage, so be ready for it. The Battlefield Ritualist gives its allies unholy fervor, which must be interrupted or else they'll gain 6% of their life back with every melee swing. The Contenders don't do a whole lot, however they charge at random players, reducing their movement speed on impact. After you take care of these enemies, you're already at the first boss. This is a council-style fight with three different bosses involved. Desia is the highest health target and mostly attacks the tank. Mortal Strike reduces the healing of her target for 10 seconds, just like normal Warrior Mortal Strike. The tank must stay in range of Desia the entire fight, because she'll occasionally cast Slam on the tank or any nearby target if the tank isn't in range. This is a hard-hitting ability that only really tanks can withstand. At low health, Desia enrages, creating an absorb shield and fixating a random player running after them. Be sure to stay away because her melees hurt if she catches you. While this is going on, Pacerin is continuously casting Plague Bolt. This ability simply deals a small amount of damage and also creates a puddle under the target's feet. It can and should be interrupted when possible. If Pacerin gets to low health, he will start hurling vials at all players, dropping pools at their feet every 8 seconds. This can be dispelled if you have a disease dispel available. Sethel casts Necromantic Bolt, which deals a moderate amount of damage but isn't a high priority cast. What does need to be interrupted though is Searing Death. If this cast goes off, it will inflict damage to a random player and everyone within a couple yards for 12 seconds. Sethel also buffs allies with Spectral Transference, healing them with each damaging spell and ability they cast. This is a magic effect, so it can be purged easily. When Sethel gets low, he gains an Absorb Shield and becomes immune to interrupt effects for up to 30 seconds. Although not listed in the Dungeon Journal, Zira the Underhanded will occasionally appear, stunlocking a player. Try to stay grouped together and be ready to free your ally out of this stun if it happens. Once the boss is defeated, you'll be taken down into the depths of the theater, where you have an option of where to go next. There are three different paths that all loop back around to the central location, ending in a boss fight. You can choose which path to go, but it isn't super consequential until you get into High Mythic Plus. You'll need to clear each boss anyway, so just pick a route and go. Heading north towards the Altars of Agony will lead to Kul Tharak, the Lich Boss. The first area in here is pretty dangerous, so you should take it slow until you're comfortable. There's a narrow hallway with swirlies that deal heavy damage if you step in them. These are pretty quick and tough to dodge if you're a caster. I'd recommend pulling some of the mobs out of this room to make it easier for your group. Shackled Souls have a 6 second channel that snares enemies and inflicts heavy shadow damage, and with so many of them it's almost impossible to keep all of them disrupted. While they're not binding, they also cast Soul Touch, which deals shadow damage to the tank or anyone nearby if the tank is running. These packs deal pretty heavy party-wide damage, so it's a great time to use defensives and healing cooldowns. After the Gauntlet of Swirlies, you'll run into the Portal Guardian. This mob's main ability is Soul Storm, dealing heavy shadow damage to everyone nearby for 20 seconds. You won't be able to outrange or line of sight this, so use defensives and burst it down. It occasionally also casts Shadow Vulnerability, a curse that deals shadow damage and causes you to take 50% increased shadow damage for 30 seconds. Be sure to use a decurse on this before the soul storm goes off and pop a heavy defensive or immunity if you don't have one. This mob drops an orb that can be placed in a portal next to it in order to advance. You can put the orb on either side and the portal will take you to a different platform. For the most part, it doesn't really matter which way you go, usually we've been going to the right. The Bone Magus starts off with a Bone Shield that absorbs damage or can be purged. They cast Bone Spear, an incredibly high physical damage ability that also applies a short dot. This is a very high priority interrupt and is one of the highest damaging abilities in the dungeon. It also casts Grave Spike, another physical damage cast that deals moderate damage. 
Maniacal Soulbinders cast Necrotic Bolt and Necrotic Bolt Volley. Both abilities deal shadow damage and create a healing absorb on the target. The volley must be kicked since it hits the whole party, but you can let a few bolt casts go off. It also casts Soul Corruption, which puts a magic debuff on a random target, dealing small amounts of shadow damage over 16 seconds. Nefarious Darkspeakers are large lich mobs that cast Death Wings, a frontal tornado that deals moderate damage and knocks you back a long way. Many of these platforms are really small. If you get hit by this, it's very likely that you'll get sent off the edge if you don't have the mobility to get back on. Try not to be the guy that gets sent off because it's a long walk back. The Dark Speakers also have Curse of Desolation, which deals shadow damage and fears the player for one second. This can be deadly in combination with the tornadoes on small platforms and can only be removed with a curse to spell. Spirit Frost is a moderate damage cast that goes on the tank, so you don't need to worry about it too much unless there's nothing else to stop. If you head left at the very first Portal Guardian, you'll run into the Soul Forged Bone Reaver. This tanky mob only has two abilities. Bone Spikes puts swirlies all over the ground, dealing shadow damage to anyone hit and Bone Storm deals physical damage to anyone within 8 yards for 4 seconds when it's cast. Whichever path you happen to go, the main difficulty of this area is simply dealing with all the caster mobs in the tight spaces. If possible, try and organize interrupts and stops ahead of time because this area definitely tests your coordination. At the end of the portal gauntlet, you'll find Kul Tharok. This is a pretty challenging boss fight, so it's a good idea to have big cooldowns and bloodlust available if possible. Throughout the fight, Kultharok will cast Phantasmal Parasite at two players at a time. This deals shadow damage to that person and anyone close by for 10 seconds. The damage isn't insignificant, so one needs to be dispelled immediately and the other player needs a strong defensive or heavy healing. Kultharok also casts Draw Soul, which separates two damage dealers from their souls for 30 seconds. The soul wanders around the room where you must reunite with it as soon as possible, because without it you take heavy damage and cannot use any abilities. Once you reclaim your soul, you get a buff that increases your damage dealt by 30% for 30 seconds. The last ability, Spectral Hands, creates grasping hands that bind you and deal shadow damage when you walk in them. You can actually use these hands to your advantage, because they also bind your soul. Running into the hands just before Draw Soul is cast traps the soul in the hands with you. This makes it a lot easier to grab it quickly and reduces your downtime. You will end up taking heavy damage though, so it's ideal to have a defensive active just before running in. If you make it out of the fight alive, you can take the portal or simply jump down to make your way back to the starting room to choose a different path to venture down. Heading southeast will take you to the Chamber of Conquest where you'll fight Zav the Unfallen. This area has various different mini-bosses, not all of which you'll run into so I'll just go over them briefly. Nikthara the Mangler has Interrupting Roar which deals moderate physical damage and interrupts your cast. This can be line of sighted to reduce damage, but isn't necessary. Whirling Blade hurls a sword that spins dealing physical damage to anyone inside. Whirlwind is a 2.5 second cast that inflicts heavy physical damage to anyone still standing inside the circle at the end of the cast. Dokig the Brutalizer can also appear in the first room, using Savage Flurry which is a simply a heavy tank hit. Dokig also continuously casts Brutal Leap, jumping on a random player after 2 seconds so be sure to step out of that. Lastly, he casts Battle Trance, which gives an Absorb Shield and increases attack speed. However, you can and should interrupt this every time. In the next room, you may find Harugia the Bloodthirsty. This elite also has Battle Trance, so be sure to interrupt that. The main mechanic of this mob is Ricocheting Blade, which targets a random player and deals moderate damage and applies a bleed to the target and anyone nearby, so be sure to stay spread. Bloodthirsty Charge is another swirly that deals heavy damage if not dodged, so avoid that as well. Alternatively, you could run into Heaven the Breaker. Heaven is almost identical to Nectara, Ground Smash is an AoE circle, and Interrupting Roar deals damage and stops your cast, Colossus Smash is the big tank hit. And finally, the last pair of champions. Wreck the Hardened has another circle to avoid, Whirlwind. Swift Strikes is a buff that increases Wreck's attack speed and causes his attacks to cleave onto nearby players. Unbalanced Blow is another heavy tank hit. I think you're starting to get the idea behind these, but there's just one more. Advent Nevermore uses Seismic Stomp, which simply deals damage to your entire party after a short cast. Ricocheting Blade is the same mechanic as before. Lastly, this mob has Unbreakable Guard, which blocks all attacks and spells from the front, so you may have to reposition to hit this mob from behind. The big trash pack on the bridge between two of the champions is particularly dangerous, so be sure to use big cooldowns here. Arbalists are archers that apply Jagged Coral to random targets. 
dealing moderate physical damage and applying a bleed for 8 seconds. The toughest part of this pack is the Ancient Captain. This mob has an aura, commanding presence, that increases damage done and reduces area of effect damage by 50%. This means you should be focusing this mob down first with single target spells and attacks before trying to nuke down the rest of the pack. It also has a cast, Demoralizing Shout, that reduces damage done by all players by 50% that must be kicked every 12 seconds. After making it through this short but mob dense area, you'll be matched up against Zav the Unfallen. Every time this boss reaches 100 energy, you will force two players into the dueling pit. You then duke it out and the winner gets a 10% damage buff for 20 seconds while the loser loses 10% damage. Have your highest damage dealer win the duel if cooldowns are available and then... Alright, let's be honest, you're just going to blow all your big cooldowns and kill your friend anyway. Back to the main boss fight. It's a simple but fun DPS check and dodge encounter. The boss will use a combination of three attacks that everyone must dodge. Crushing Slam is a narrow frontal. Deafening Crash is a big AoE circle that interrupts casts and Massive Cleave is a wide frontal that covers half the room. This dodging would be easy, however occasionally the boss will use Oppressive Banner. While the banner is out, it reduces your party's movement speed significantly, making the three-part combo nearly impossible to dodge. This is one of the few fights where healer and tank DPS helps immensely, because you'll be put in a scenario where two DPS players are dueling and then the banner is placed down. Switch to the banner and focus it down immediately, especially considering the mage in your party is a zoo animal and probably combusted you during the dueling phase. The last of the three wings is located to the west, the Barrow of Carnage. This area is pretty dangerous with many important casts and heavy group damage. In the first room, you'll run into Disgusting Refuse. This mob has a leap that jumps to a random player and cleaves small amounts of physical damage. When these are killed, they spawn a swirly that should be avoided, or else you're inflicted with a disease that deals damage and reduces your damage and healing done by 20%. Disease Horrors have a heavy tank hit that will also hit nearby players if the tank isn't enranged. Decaying Strike deals physical damage and also applies Decaying Blight, a disease that deals periodic damage and reduces max health by 5% for each stack. These mobs also cast Meat Shield, a channeled ability that creates an Absorb Shield that must be interrupted. Neither one of these abilities recast if stunned, so you can use other types of mob control to stop them if you don't have an interrupt available. Blighted Sludge Spewers leap to their target just like the Refuse, however they're caster mobs. Decaying Filth is a 2 second cast that deals plague damage and applies that same disease that reduces your max health. This can be interrupted, however the most important spell to stop is Withering Discharge. This deals large amounts of plague damage and applies Withering Blight the same disease that reduces your damage and healing. Be careful in this first room, it's easy to get overwhelmed by casts if you pull too many at a time. At the end of the hall you can choose to go either left or right, but both paths are the same and you'll run into a rancid gas bag. This mob has a disease cloud that pulses plague damage every 2 seconds to anybody within 15 yards. The cloud persists on death, so make sure not to fight another pack near one of these mobs after you kill them. The gas bag casts Vile Eruption, which is a frontal and, let's call it a backle. It deals heavy damage to anyone in front or behind it alongside a 3 second disorient. This can be pretty deadly considering your whole party is taking pulsing damage already, so be really careful not to get hit by it. This whole area in general is pretty dangerous. I recommend using Rogue Shrouds or Invis Potions if they're available to skip parts of it, and taking the stuff you do decide to fight slowly. At the end is a lone patrolling gas bag, however when you enter the bridge many mobs jump from the sides to join it so be careful here as well. Warchop awaits you at the end in what is a fun but pretty hectic fight. Hateful Strike is a tank hit. I know I've mentioned a lot of these but this one hurts pretty bad. Throughout the fight, Warchop pulls you towards him then casts Tenderizing Smash, a circle around him that deals large amounts of damage. Don't get caught off guard by this and get ready to move out right as you get pulled in. While this is going on, meat hooks sweep across the room. There are safe spots in between each wave, however two waves pass through at a time so you'll need to maneuver through the safe zones. If you get hit by these hooks, you get pulled into the other edge of the arena and suffer from jagged gash. This is a very high damage bleed over 8 seconds so defensive must be used immediately if the hook ever catches you. What makes this fight difficult is the oozing leftovers. These are adds that run in through the sides of the room, leaping towards random targets and dealing physical damage. The adds themselves aren't too dangerous. They actually slowly lose health until they die, so you don't even really need to worry about focusing them. 
What's dangerous is after they die, they leave a pool of ooze on the ground, dealing plague damage to anyone standing in the area and also reducing movement speed by 50%. This makes dodging the hooks much more difficult if you ever get pulled into the ooze. It's important that the tank continuously moves the boss away from the puddles, and when possible, try to knock the adds away and kill them on the edges of the room so that the pools don't get in your way. Once you defeat all three bosses, you can return back to the theater to fight the final boss, Mordretha the Endless Empress. Mordretha is another very well designed fight that has a mix of dodging, ad control, and moderate damage. Following the theme of every other mob in the dungeon, Reaping Scythe is a heavy hitting tank ability that casts every 12 seconds or so. Dark Devastation is a large frontal beam targeted at a random player that slowly spins around in a circle. Grasping Rift creates a portal in the room that slowly drags you towards it. If you touch it, you're stunned for 8 seconds and take large amounts of shadow damage. Overlapping with these abilities comes Manifest Death. This deals light shadow damage for 6 seconds and then at the end hits much harder to you and anyone else within 6 yards. This can get a little tricky when trying to dodge the many mechanics of the fight, but isn't too deadly if you happen to cleave a friend by accident. The fight continues, going back and forth between these abilities until 50% health, when the boss casts Echoes of Carnage. This deals group damage and summons ghosts around the room. These ghosts can either charge around the room or simply just deal damage in a swirly, but should be avoided because they deal large amounts of damage if you're hit. The fight then resumes with all the previous mechanics while the ghosts are taking up space and adding additional complication. Continue dodging the beams, rifts, and ghosts while you drop the boss to zero. Once you down Mordretha, the dungeon is over. Collect your loot and go again. That wraps up my dungeon guide for Theater of Pain. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or tips that you think I miss, drop them down in the comments for people to see later on. If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like and subscribe to my channel. I'll be coming out with guides for each mythic dungeon and raid boss. Happy keying!